Okay, um, so we are at about two minutes after. I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, there'll be uh, still a few minutes for uh, for people to join, but uh, we've got a great topic today. Um, it's it's one of those things that gets uh, talked about a lot and very rarely get uh, uh, deep enough to to have real discussions about it. And that, of course, is AI. You know, so we're going to talk about that specifically in the context of uh, associations today. Uh, really lucky to be joined by our friends from uh, from Contentware. And so we're uh, looking forward to a uh, uh, really great discussion there. Um, I'm Bill Conforti. Uh, I'm the uh, Senior VP of Strategy and Solutions uh, with Association uh, Analytics. I've uh, been there for uh, about eight years and gone through uh, custom BI solutions all the way up through our current uh, focus on the Ackman product, which uh, a lot of you uh, are, are aware of. So uh, I'll be the, the, the host today. Uh, Mitch is going to do all the heavy lifting in terms of the content. I'll just pop in with uh, a few questions here and there. And of course, uh, wrap things up with uh, a little bit of a recap in relation to our product document uh, at the very end. So um, I'm going to kick it over to, uh, to Mitch uh, for an introduction. Thanks, Bill. Excited to be here. My name is Mitch Eisen, and I'm the uh, CTO of Contentware. And just as kind of quick background, um, I was involved in creating a marketing automation platform called Real Magnet that, that was a sort of full-blown marketing platform that served the association space. So we have a lot of knowledge and experience in the association world, understand what people are concerned about, understand how associations work. And I know that AI is a big topic, that people are very interested in learning about it, but don't really, aren't sure how to get started. So hopefully this session will be a good icebreaker, get you thinking about things, get you started about things, get you a little uncomfortable about things, about maybe some urgency behind that. So looking forward to jumping in. All right, awesome. So, uh, so here's our agenda. You know, as as usual, we'll start with uh, some very brief introductions and not polls, just one poll today. Um, we're going to turn things over to Mitch. He's going to have a primer on AI, like a really good introduction on all the key things that we need to know. We'll talk about applications of AI, I'm trying to re relate that to the association space in particular. Uh, oh boy, thank you. Okay, how are we doing now? Okay, uh, all right, so intro and polls. Uh, we're gonna do a primer on AI. We'll talk about applications specifically to the association space. Uh, Mitch is really an expert on marketing and communication. So we're gonna talk about that for, um, you know, for a good part of the, the AI piece. And then of course, we'll wrap it up with uh, a bit of discussion uh, on Acumen. Okay, um, who is A2? Um, we go through this in, in most of the webinars. We won't spend a lot of time here. Uh, but we're the developers of the Acumen uh, data analytics platform. Um, it's a, a SaaS solution with you know complementary uh, products and services, and we have all of the services that go around that, including data governance, data strategy, you know onboarding, training, and all of that. Uh, we've been doing this for about 20 years. The last five of which are dedicated to uh, the Acumen product, and uh, we're lucky enough to have a 100% uh, client retention rate um, on Acumen. So uh, things are going uh, great so far. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to a poll question to get us started, which is, which best describes AI as it relates to your association, All right? Everybody is talking about it. I know I need to learn more about it, or we need to implement it, right? We need to implement AI or we're working towards that. I don't know where to begin. Or lastly, maybe this uh, webinar will provide more insight, right? I assume that would be the case for most of us. So. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look. All right, um, so forty-four percent, you know, by far the biggest uh, share said, "I know that I need to learn more about AI." So, for those of you that said that, um, I'm uh, I'm wondering why you feel that way, right? If you have any comments on that, that'd be a great thing to um, to put in the chat, right? Um, Thirteen percent said that we need to implement AI, or at least we're working towards that. So that's maybe a little bit bigger than I was expecting. 25% um, of us don't know where to begin and 19 or 20% of us think that this webinar will provide some insight. So those 20% are definitely correct. Uh, 
And uh, so, so Mitch, I'm wondering, 25% um, uh, say they don't know where to begin. Does that number seem about right to you or are you expecting a well, bigger or smaller? The first thing I always notice about these polls, it's a radio button and not a checkbox because I think people want to answer more than one answer, which is I need to know about it and I don't know where to begin and we need to implement it. So the numbers don't strike me at all as surprising. I think we're in this era right now where this is the thing, the next big thing, and everyone needs to know I need to implement it. Where do I begin? How do I start thinking about it? How can I do something practical? Is this approachable? So these numbers fall exactly where I think they would be. Awesome. Uh, okay, um, so with that, I'm gonna uh, kick things over to, uh, to Mitch. I mean, the good news is no matter how you answer that question, there's definitely something um, in this uh, for everyone. Well, thanks, Bill, and I appreciate it. So first to start off to give some background, the way I look at this is the AI train is rolling. That I think everyone can appreciate, but here's the thing, no one can stop this thing. It is everywhere right now, no matter how, even if you're not involved in AI, if you think about it from the grammar checker you use in Google Docs to whether you're gonna get a loan based on your credit worthiness, whether a resume that you submit will even be reviewed by a human or even the price of an airline ticket that you're about to purchase, everything is driven by AI. When you swerve out of a lane and there's an indicator in your car, that's AI. It is almost integrated into every, every digital interaction we do, whether that be on a personal or a professional level. And here's the thing. If you look at kind of this evolution of technology over time, these are all kind of like the three industrial revolutions and this everyone is talking about AI is the fourth. Here's what's different about it. I'm not one to engage in hyperbole, but I really believe that this is happening faster than all of the others. And what's actually more probably concerning about it is this is the one we understand the least of everything. Sure, the steam engine changed technology and changed the world forever, but we understood what it did. It transported people from A to B. We understood about mass production and we even understood about the, the, the rise of digital in terms of what the internet looks like today. But in many cases, AI right now is a mystery even to those that are very much involved with it. And that is one of the things that is both very challenging about it. And also we need to start asking questions like, just because we can do this, should we do this? So for me, I think it's important to think about how an organization who's considering bringing AI on, how should you view AI? First and foremost, artificial intelligence is a tool to get you to a goal. It is not, capital N-O-T, the goal in of itself. To say that I implemented AI in our organization honestly is meaningless. What you need to be asking is, I have these business challenges. I have these organizational challenges and how can AI help me answer those questions? And I think that that's a huge thing to just contextualize everything. It is not the goal. It is a tool to get you to the goal. So overall, I think that there are three areas where we can look at um, that AI can have an impact. The first one is process automation, right? And that is, you know, where you can automate repetitive tasks that are kind of kind of, or quote unquote, low level. Think about things like, I don't know, like responding to frequent and common member inquiries. Someone ask a question of when is my membership renewed? When is the annual conference? You don't really need a human to do that. It's repetitive. There's not a lot of high value in those interactions. AI can help you automate those things. Um, now, the thing about, honestly, about process automation, automation in general is, you know, we hear the same promises about AI as we did about previous technologies, like marketing automation, or even other things like this is going to save you a lot of time. But you know what, I have to say the truth is me personally, and everyone I talk to, we are busier than ever before, regardless of all of these promises of what technologies like AI can bring. And honestly, I've come to the conclusion that they, they free up time, but not time for emptiness. They free up time only to be consumed 
by other things that these technologies enable. So I think a really good way to think about it is that using AI, you can kind of outsource the more mundane, repetitive, low level tasks and have your people focus on much higher end quality interactions that are better. The second way or the second kind of um, um, way to view AI is through data analysis, right? And that is collecting massive amounts of data that we have in our members and prospects. And once again, as a tool, using AI to provide insight that drives better decisions. And honestly, this is something that AI is actually uniquely capable of because we as humans can't process that amount of data. We can't play out all of these different scenarios. Now, it's not without its challenges, right? You know, data analysis, like, like, like there's a lot of challenges where AI can provide insight, but it can be challenging to accomplish that. We'll talk about it later. The third area to think and view through of AI applications is audience engagement, right? AI has real, real promises in helping associations more deeply understand both their members and their, pros and their prospects in terms of their preferences, whether that be subject matter, what are the specific subject matter that I that member A is interested versus member B, but also also with the channels. Maybe member A and member B are both interested in the same topics, but member A wants to receive that information via a different channel than member B does. And I think it's important to keep this as kind of a context of how to think about AI. Now, <laughs> the first thing is, Unbeknownst to you, you're probably already using a lot of AI. Most of the technologies that associations are using on a daily basis, whether that be your AMS or your CRM or your marketing automation platform, or even your website platform that might be integrated with chatbots or whatever, most of the technologies that you're currently using have some level of AI in there already. So the reality is that really increasingly, your association is gonna be relying more and more on AI. By the way, even if you don't do anything individually, but the key is to keep track of the changes as these get um, rolled out from these, in these platforms that you're using and understand how you can leverage the already built-in tools to advance your organizational goals, okay? That is just key to doing it. You're not, we're not here to reinvent the wheels. This is not a training session for how do you become a data scientist. That is not to be able to throw around a lot of jargon about model building and all of this. Yes, those are all important, but as a good starting point, you already have in those platforms that you're already using, there are already AI driven discovery tools that can help you more fully understand the potential. And I really think, as I mentioned before, that AI is a much faster technological revolution than anything we've seen before. So it's, it's, it's no longer a choice of like, hey, should I or shouldn't I incorporate AI? This is the must and it's the time right now to start paying very, very close attention to it. So really, you know, AI is such a broad field and we're not gonna be able to talk about all of these different things, but I think it's important to kind of analyze these into a few different buckets or categories. The first one we touched on, which is data analytics. There's also natural language processing, and then there's kind of the computer vision. So, you know, for computer vision, this is kind of the, 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 the things that, that how your self-driving vehicle can um, understand what a pedestrian is versus a mailbox. And we're not really gonna talk about that. This is kind of Elon Musk stuff out there. And I don't think there's really, <laughs> that type of broad applications for associations today. But data analytics. So we already touched on this briefly. It's basically taking and combining the huge amounts of data that associations have and combining that with the power of AI to gain insights into your members and prospects. But again, what is that insight? What's the value of that insight? The value of that insight is not to know, but to make better decisions to serve those members and prospects better. Now, the really good news is that associations have massive amounts of data, lots and lots of data. Unfortunately, there's also bad news associated with that. The bad news is there is a lot of work to do to get that data, quote unquote, operational to see the benefits. So while I do see 
um, um, applications, data-driven applications, that they can provide probably the most long-term benefits of AI, they're probably more challenging to implement right off the bat. And we're gonna dive into that with some specifics in a little while. Natural language processing. These are things like AI writing assistance, automated content generation, et cetera. And actually, in my view, these are perhaps the quickest and least risky ways in which associations can start using AI today, right away with little investment and potentially big benefits. So let's kind of dive in and look at it. But I do think it's actually very useful to first kind of do a quick um, review of personalization. Because at the end of the day, kind of AI powered data, I mean, not to minimize it, but really what it does is it helps fuel that personalization. So I think it's really useful to kind of see where we were, where we are and where we're going with personalization. So the first phase of personalization was, there was none, okay? <laughs> Associations treated every member the exact same way, right? At least in terms of communications, right? Um, in the early pre-digital days, what did associations do? They printed maybe a monthly newsletter and they distributed that same monthly newsletter with the same content to everyone. Then they transitioned to digital. No one's really sending out printed newsletters anymore. These are all electronically distributed communications, but they basically followed the same model because there really wasn't any technology to allow them to do any different. So everyone got the same content as everyone else, but this time they did it digitally. Now, I am not gonna ask for a show of hands of who is currently and continuing to do it this way. You know who you are and, and, and you know that you wanna change. But that is kind of the first kind of um, um, start of personalization. Then we got into more of, let's call it crude segmentation, where let's just say, I don't know, you were a uh, medical related organization and you had members both as doctors and as nurses. So you recognize that maybe nurses would be interested in receiving different type of content than doctors were. But here's the thing. You were the one that defined those segments and you were the one that created the different content. But already we started doing something a little differently. We didn't look at everyone homogeneously. Different segments could have different interests and we want to deliver different content to them. Then we got into phase three, okay, which is more sophisticated kind of behavioral segmentation. Basically saying, okay, sure, there are nurses and there are doctors. That's basically demographic or firmographic information. But what we really need to do is who cares if they're a nurse or a doctor? What do they want? What does their behavior tell us? What are they clicking on? What are they expressing an interest on? And let's segment people based on their behavior. So now all of a sudden, those segments are not necessarily being created exclusively by you. People are self-segmenting themselves based on their behavior. Now, what you're still doing is you're creating the content for each one of those segments. But now we get into the phase that we are rapidly in right now, which is hyper-segmentation, where AI can look at all this vast amount of information and they and the AI can segment that theoretically into a segment of one. And not only that, the AI can either serve up the content for that person in the right time and even, even generate or write that content. So this is an important evolution of where we are and the potential of really getting to that literally one-to-one -one communication of delivering that right communication to that member at the exact time via the right channel. So let's awesome. look a little on the hey, Mitch, data. Can I, yeah, maybe sorry, maybe I can in interrupt you for a quick question. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so, so we talk about this a lot, right? The idea of getting the right content to the, to the, right, um, the right individuals or the right segments. And, and we talk about how to use Acumen for that. I'll even, I'll even talk about it a little bit in, in today's conversation uh, at the very end. But um, the idea of that hyper-segmentation or that, that segment of one, um, I wonder is... Can we achieve that that hyper segmentation without creating the content dynamically, right? Because we have already a lot of content that we're maybe not exactly optimized, right? We're not exactly matching it up in the best way we could uh, to our members uh, and and customers. So, are are those two things like uh, uh, necessary, you know, for each other? 
So think about it this way. There, there are two separate uh, kind of functions, but they're related or they can be interrelated. So right now you've got, let's start with the content. You have all your existing content. Everyone snaps their fingers and you've got all of your blogs, all of your white papers, all of your member communication. It's all sitting there. No new content is being created. So in theory, in theory, the AI can understand people's or members and prospects' interests and can match them and serve them up the content, call it from a content bank. So I've got all this content sitting in my content bank. By the way, maybe some of it you thought that was never even operational. You did this maybe six months ago and you forgot about it, but some segment of that member um, population is most probably interested in that. The AI can help match the preferences and the interest and the behavior and the timing and the channel with theoretically all the content that's currently sitting in your bank. So it, you don't necessarily need to create more. It can take what you have and match that with um, members in a much more efficient way than theoretically you can do that. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, that's great. And as you go into this next one with the, with the use cases, um, you know, these are all things, again, that, that we've talked about a lot on, on how to use a tool uh, like Acumen. And then the, the sort of the, the longer term or the next step in a lot of that is, okay, how do we automate this? So this is, this is really interesting to, to kind of take it to, um, to the next level. So it's even beyond just uh, leveraging, you know, the data you have within an analytics tool to kind of manually um, interpret and to get to some of these things, but to, to get to the point where you're doing some of that uh, programmatically and uh, and using AI is really, uh, is really awesome. So anyway, uh, sorry, Mitch, go, go ahead. So, so when you think about it on these, like da the data analysis, if you look at it, I put a couple of things there. And for a second, just ignore the last one, internal hiring decision. Truth of the matter is the first one is the only important one. All the others, what are they? They're subcomponents of the first one. Membership engagement is our top priority. And by the way, it's our biggest challenge, right? How do we keep members engaged? If, you know, I always ask this of, of like association, what keeps you up at night? And really it boils down to this. How do, we, how do we keep members engaged? And really there's one answer. You always have to be relevant. So they're like, okay, Mitch, that's super easy. You gave a stupid answer, relevant. How do I remain relevant, right? And that's where AI can come in. We, as an association executive, you need to understand what members are interested in. You need to know when members want to be contacted. You need to know where members want to be contacted. And you need to know kind of their expertise and their subject matter so you can match them with the right type of content. And this is exactly where AI can help, right? Because really all of this comes from the data, right? We have and by the way, it's not so easy. I'm going to talk about this in a second. There's a lot of challenges associated with this, but we have far greater potential today than we ever had before to meeting those expectations of delivering that content, right? Basically, the AI can sift through all of the vast amounts of data we have on members, it can draw correlations, it can see patterns that we cannot see and make recommendations really to help us engage with members. 100% success rate, 100% absolutely not true. Can you do better than you're doing now? 100% yes. So really specifically, if you think about it, let's look at a more granular one, membership renewal, right? What if you could know which members were likely to renew and which ones were not likely to renew? Would you do anything differently in terms of outreach or your renewal, or, or your renewal process? You very well might be. So instead of just throwing darts at the board, this Mitch might renew, Bill might not renew, you can let AI help you understand those so you can prioritize those members that might be in jeopardy of um, not renewing. In terms of content um, preferences, there's a huge one, right? This is instead of sending everything to everyone or blindly making, I don't know, uninformed segmentation decisions, you can let AI help you identify exactly what members are interested in and provide them really with a curated stream of content. Think of, I don't know, like next Netflix for associations, right? You can, is it like a pipe dream? No, not really. There are already platforms that are beginning to do this, curated streams of content that are highly targeted 
to either a group or a single individual. Conference attendance is another big one. We all know how important annual meetings are and other conferences are. Um, but you can have far better insight if you knew who was more likely to attend. You could design sessions specifically for that segment. And again, AI can provide a lot of use cases. Now, the last one I put on there, it's not necessarily like part of the same matrix if you think of it. It's more of an internal type of function, but increasingly AI is playing a huge role in hiring, right? Resume reviews, things of that nature. And there's a lot of challenges associated with that, that, that um, you know, just as much as AI can help HR, it can also cause a lot of problems. And this is perhaps one of the more controversial ways because of that black box nature of AI, it rejects this candidate and it accepts this candidate based on what? People don't know. There's inherent biases based into these algorithms, but with caution and used carefully, I think that, that um, using the data as the underpinning of these algorithms can really help on um, the hiring side as well. So before everyone gets excited and goes out and hires their team of data scientists, let's do a reality check on this. I think in order to achieve a lot of the benefits that we just talked about, delivering that automatic content to that person at the time of higher probability of decision-making, it's possible, but what do you need? You need data and lots and lots of data. As I said before, the good news is associations have lots of this data. I mean, think about all of the engagement interactions that are sitting in your marketing automation platform or all that conference and session attendance information, plus all the website data in your AMS CRM. You have a massive amount of data on members and prospects. But the bad news is th that the quantity is not really sufficient. It's not about, I mean, it can be about a lot of data, but that data needs to be high quality. And that means that data needs to be scrubbed. It needs to be cleaned. It needs to be tagged and needs to be stored in a manner that AI can utilize. And by the way, this is no small feat to do that. It's very, very challenging to do that. And honestly, this is the very thing where I see um, a lot of um, organizations and their AI projects going off the rail. High ambition, sure we have lots of data. They don't pay attention to enough of that data of how to structure it and clean it. And those projects tend to go off the rails more quickly than others. So the recommendation is going back to what I said earlier, probably in your AMS or your CMS, you know, association analytics, these guys are doing it already. They've got the tools built in to help do discovery, AI generated discovery. So don't necessarily embark on your own. Number one, use the tools that are already available to help start understanding. If you do want to go on an AI project kind of on your own and see, see how, it, how successful it might be, my recommendation would be to start with a very discrete data set, whether that means email data or some sort of session data something that's manageable, something that you can wrangle in a way so you can really test out what the benefits might in fact be. Um, uh, Mitch, uh, quick question. Sure. Quick question, just uh, uh, some, a, lot of, a lot of, everything you said there resonates uh, uh, a lot with us and I totally agree that um, you know, the, the data wrangling piece and the data quality more broadly is the number one obstacle to, to really doing anything uh, with uh, with data, you know, much less getting to the point of uh, you know being able to to leverage uh, AI. You know, so my my question is about because you brought up you know tagging and um, and categorization of the data. So my question is about training or training the model, so to speak. This is something that that comes up often. Um, you know, when we talk about some of the AI that's used in our product, we very often get a question about how does uh, how do we train the model? Can you talk about that a little bit, just for um, yeah, to, to educate kind of like, the audience a little bit. Sure. So there's two types of things you have, and there's all, I'm not going to throw on a lot of jargon, but you can have a trained model. A model is like, hey, give the AI some examples of like, hey, this is good and this is bad. Uh, and you tag those. You tag those with a simple thing like good and bad. Maybe that is, um, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We'll talk about like a sentence, maybe AI assisted writing. This is good one, this is bad one. And if you give 
the AI enough examples of that, it can start understanding what is good and what is bad. But think about what that means. You have to have a consistent way of labeling what is good and what is bad. Now, all of a sudden, you're into subjectivity. I might think it's good. You might think it's bad. So that's one way of doing it where you actually annotate or tag or supervise the learning process of the AI that's called supervised. Or there's another one which is unsupervised learning. Okay. Throw all this data at AI and don't tell it anything about it and have the AI kind of cluster or, or create its own segments by itself. And there's certain value to that to gain insight into that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that uh, uh, that's, that's an example that we talk about a lot where you know, something like creating a, a persona, you know, based on known parameters might be more supervised, right? But uh, if we just take a bunch of raw data and let the, um, and, and kind of uh, let the, the the patterns be found, that, that's kind of the unsupervised analysis or, or cluster type analysis, which is, uh, you know, something that we're uh, working on as well. So uh, great. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, but even, but think about it this way. Okay. And this is a perfect segue into this. Okay. Who cares if it's supervised, unsupervised? Let me ask you everyone a question. Who watches every show Netflix um, recommends? Who buys everything that Amazon recommends of them? 100% of you do not buy 100% of what is recommended. And that's because it is a probability. And that's what's so important of all of these things. What I see is people think this, you know, AI is this magic, this alchemy, like if AI says it, it's gospel. No. It's a probability. It is what is the likelihood that this member will renew? What is the likelihood that, that, that this content will help drive engagement? And you have to match that, that, that probability, AI-driven probability, with your own instincts and your own experiences. You are smart. A computer is dumb. Yes, a computer can see patterns that you might not see, but only to surface them so you can use your high value analysis to, and your instinct to say what is better and also to test it. So in the end, I think you know AI decision is becoming more and more important and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's important to kind of scope it out so you don't let this thing run away from you. But more so I think is the second category of AI application, which is more on kind of um, natural language processing. And honestly, um, you know, these are things like AI assisted writing, content creation, website experiences, etc. And it's here that I honestly think that organizations can, can benefit from AI the quickest, the fastest, the cheapest, and with the least risk possible. Um, but let's do a small experiment first, okay? So here are two passages, okay, that are written for a marketing about um, HTML. Number one, we'll show you how to build an HTML template that won't disappoint. This is a great way to make sure your campaign looks the same across email marketing platforms, email clients, and web browsers. Pretty good. Or find out how to create a branded HTML email template that works across all email marketing platforms, email clients, and browsers. Pretty cool too. Who wrote that? <clears throat> did AI write that or did a human write that? Let's look at another one. Discover a tested step-by-step -step process for creating an HTML email template that is always consistent and professional. Once again, pretty darn good. How about this one? You learn how to create an HTML template with a step-by-step -step process created by experts in the industry. So who wrote those? Is it AI or is it, um, a human wrote that. Now, I'm not even gonna tell you which one it, well, maybe I will. In every case, it's the second one that was um, um, written, or the first one was written by AI and the second one was written by a human. Now, here's the thing. It really doesn't make a difference. And this is what I wanna show and how we're rapidly getting into this next phase. You will not be able to tell the difference of whether a human wrote it or an AI wrote it. And people like, oh my, they're like, oh my God, that's, wow, that's bad, that's horrible. But I say, who cares, right? You don't care whether the, the, whether the, the two numbers that you're adding up to see how many people are attending 
your, um, your annual meeting were calculated doing long division or addition or a calculator. You don't care. You want the answer. And, if, and in this case, it's the content that is the answer. So we're rapidly getting into an area where content can be scaled exponentially. Now, you know, in a way, I think that this is a very good thing. We're gonna talk about more details of it, but look, looking at these examples, we're no longer able to tell what is being written by a human or what is being written by an AI. So let's look at first some of the more practical ones, right? These are AI assisted writing, okay? And here, probably the easiest way to start benefiting from AI is to use some of these AI assisted writing tools. And the truth is you've been using these for years, whether that is grammar checkers in Google Docs or Microsoft Word. But over the last years, these tools have expanded their capabilities with I think pretty stunning results. You can now use these things to actually write individual content. And we're gonna look at some examples in a little while. You can help, um, it can help you rephrase or paraphrase content, okay? It can generate original content ideas that you can use for blogs or email subject lines. And you can even use it for formatting documents, right? Now, I get it that, you know, this might not seem the sexiest of AI applications. When everyone thinks of AI, they're thinking of that massive amounts of data and that hyper segmentation getting to an audience of one. And I think that's all good, but it's harder to do. These are ways in which you can get started much easier and quicker. It's easy implementation, it's low cost, low risk with quick results. And there's also the added benefit of tangibly kind of understanding that AI is a tool. It's not the end of itself. And it, the best results actually come from the collaboration between AI and the human interaction. So there's scores and scores of these tools that are available online now. So I would encourage everyone to just kind of Google AI assisted writing you can find all others and towards the end of the webinar, we'll see an example of one of these in actions, but they're pretty darn cool, right? You can just put in a couple of words, a couple of sentences, it gives you ideas for blogs. It can write email subject lines. It can um, even write a draft of a blog for you. So pretty exciting stuff that's coming. Probably the next best one is, you know, if you think about it, if you're involved in marketing, everybody knows the mantra, you have to feed the content machine. And we're caught up in this vicious cycle, right? The organization needs to stand out more. How do we do that? Got to generate more content. Cool, we do that. Other organizations are generating more content. We have to stand out more. How do we do that? We generate more content. We need more content for specific audiences. Every time everyone is asking, I need more, I need more, I need varied, I need different ones. But it's now possible, okay, to generate an entire marketing or promotional campaign with call it 50 plus emails and social media posts in a matter of minutes. And we're gonna see it in literally a matter of minutes. So really in here, what AI is allowing organizations to do, and this is important, is to really scale their marketing and content operations, right? These, you know, these campaigns can include fully written emails, social media type, uh, social media posts, et cetera, and all in a matter of minutes. So they're, you know, these are fairly new um, types of applications that are coming out with AI, uh, but they're, they're becoming more popular. And again, we're gonna see it um, in action. But I think it's critical to understand, even with these types of applications, is the expectation, right? It's not that I'm gonna press a button and AI is gonna write my entire campaign, all of my emails, gonna write my annual report, it's gonna write my social media posts, it's gonna post them and I'm not gonna do anything. Really what we're saying is, is people talk about all the time, oh my God, you're gonna bring this tool on, it's gonna replace me, it's gonna kick me out, I'm gonna lose my job. It's actually the opposite. What we're talking about here is bringing AI onto the team. AI is not replacing anyone on the team, AI is being brought onto the team so current members of the team can do higher value things. And we're gonna see about this in just a bit, how really remarkable some of this can be. Do you have to do some work? Yes, you have to do some editing, you have to do something, but it is far less than anything else that, you, that you'll have to do. So, so Mitch, how does, uh, if it's gonna create content for my organization, it has to 
um, you know, essentially know or, or, or learn, right, some of my specific terminology and language and things like that. So talk about how do I, how do I connect the, the AI to my existing content? And so if there's like a basis for, for creating the, uh, the, the new content, does that make sense? It does. Now, the thing is, it's, it's really amazing what these things can do. Now, you can take a pretty um, um, specific topic with acronyms and abbreviations, and you can say, hey, write a blog on this or subject lines or blog topics, and it'll know what that is and, and help you do it. And essentially what it does is think about it this way. Some of these AI models, these natural language models, they have access to essentially Wikipedia and all public content yeah. online. So what happens is in a matter of seconds, and we're gonna see it just in a minute, you can put in a topic and in a matter of seconds, it's gonna pull all this information from all of these public sources and it's gonna create a cohesive, well-written piece of content. But, but it is not original. And this is really important. People are working on it now but it's not original. Like it doesn't, it, it's, AI has a hard time with new concepts. And I think the best way to think about it is let's say you wanted a blog on something and you didn't have time to write it yourself. So you would give, let's say you hired someone who didn't know anything about the subject. What would that person do? They would go out and research it on the internet. They would find public documents about this. They might interview people that were interviewed like in articles and they would synthesize, summarize and write that. That's exactly what AI does, but it does it in seven seconds as opposed uh -huh. to a week of drafts back and forth. Yeah, great. Right? So another one where, you know, um, when evaluating AI, you know, organizations tend to look outwards, right? Of what can AI do for my organization externally for members and prospects? Super important. But we tend to not really think about what it can do internally for our own organization, right? So, you know, just as um, member engagement is important, in today's world, we've all sort of, you know, still in, but coming out of the pandemic, talent is the most important thing. How do I forget about retaining members and prospects? I got to retain talent within my organization. So a lot of these tools that we've talked about that can be used for personalizing communications, chatbots, things at a granular level can be used internally for organizations as well. It's, it's, it's sort of a less sexy thing to talk about, and I don't want to spend so much time on it, but it's important to keep that one in mind also. Probably one of the more exciting things that we have now that is really starting to become um, actually possible is real-time website personalization. So if you think about the idea that we talked about, the hyper-personalization for communications, that was kind of outbound communications, right? I'm going to send out a newsletter. Instead of sending the same thing to everyone, I've got 10, 12 different segments. And I'm going to write something specific to those segments and send out that newsletter. That's cool, right? Because now all of a sudden, I'm seeing content that is highly valuable to me right away. Now, what if you could do that in real time on your website? What if think, everyone think about your website, got it in mind, think about your homepage. What is it? It's one home page. One home page. Sure, there's different sections in there, but it's one home page. Now, what happens if Mitch comes to that page and 10 seconds later, Bill comes to that page? What are we seeing? The same thing. But we don't have to any longer. Right now, just like we're personalizing outbound communications, like, like curated newsletters or conference invitations or things of that nature, we can automate real-time website personalization, such when I land on that page, on your homepage, I'm going to see something that is perhaps different from what Bill is seeing. And what are those things that I'm going to see are different? It's going to depend on who I am, what I've done, what we believe I want to do, what information I want to obtain, and what is the interest of you as the organization that I want to deliver. So we're rapidly approaching this. And by the way, it also might be that the content that I see on that web page is written almost in real time to match what I'm looking for. So this is some of the stuff that's coming down the road. It's still out there and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be tested out. But this is rapidly coming where we're going to have this, this hyper-personalization. 
So it's really, really um, exciting and really important to look at this. So let's jump in and just take a look at some of these things in action because they're very cool. So for example, if we look at, um, oops, sorry. Here. Let's take a look at our the title of our uh, of our webinar now, and let's just say what we wanted to do is we wanted to take something like this, and we wanted to generate some content, up, right? Let's say we didn't we didn't really have um, a blog written about. It. So let's go into a copywriting tool like this. We're going to say, "What do you want to write? I want to write some blog text, just the, just the title." I'm going to put this in a description. I'm going to put in, let's say, associations in AI, and I'm going to click that. Now, one, two, three, takes about three seconds. Now, look at this. Okay. Now, I'm not saying this is going to win any Nobel Prize here, but this gets you, if you think about a marathon, an analogy, instead of starting at mile one and having to, to run up to mile 26, this starts you at mile 25, fully hydrated, fully rested, fully creative, and ready to go. It's remarkable at the, the speed and the quality that it can create. Now, is this, is this like, you know, like, like I said, is it going to win any Pulitzer Prize? No. But, but here's what it does, okay? There's a need for both quantity. You have to have a lot of a lot of content. Tools like this can help you scale those, those content operations so you can produce a lot of these in order to free up your time so you can do much more of the high value writing where you focus on real thought leadership, something that's unique to you, to your organization, that's not out there. So no AI or no researcher is going to find it because it's your original thought. So that's one of these types of tools which are remarkable that you can do in a matter of seconds. The other one I talked about is how you can, you can really scale, not just a single post or a single thing, but how do you scale, let's say, creating a campaign for something. So there are tools like this that are out there. Let's say you wanted to promote a webinar. You can just go through these automated tools, you know, answer a few very basic questions. And, if you're ready to promote, let's say a webinar or something, you're gonna have people, you wanna drive them to a registration page that looks something like this. It doesn't even need a lot of information, it just needs the URL of that, whether it's a webinar or white paper or what have you, it needs, it, it's nothing. And then automatically it can generate content literally in a matter of minutes that looks like this. It can create 75 pieces of content 12 emails, X number of Facebook posts that are all written and ready to go. So think about in our same kind of analogy of a marathon, as opposed to starting at mile one, you now have 74 pieces of content ready to be reviewed. Do you have to review them and look at them? Yes, and you should. Why? Because you're not wasting a lot of time thinking about how to write these things. What you're doing is you're spending your high value creative time tweaking, making these small adjustments. It's going to take this content and make it instead of just great, really, really great. So these are some of the, the, the scalable tools that are available out there to create both individual pieces of content, like blog posts that we saw here in a matter of seconds, as well as even generating full campaign content that can really help you scale those content operations. So those are some real world examples of what we can do. And I'll turn it back over to you, Bill. All right, awesome. Yeah, so th thank you so much. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of obviously really great information there. One, a couple of things that I'd want to point out. I mean, one is this is really awesome tool for, uh, uh, for those associations that are in, a, in the, they're, maybe they're small staff, they're trying to do more with less, right? So starting at mile 25 is, you know, as Mitch said, is way better than starting at mile one. You still have to curate the stuff. You still have to provide that uh, specific domain expertise so you have specific knowledge, but this is going to get you uh, a long way towards uh, your goal. Now, uh, the other, and the other thing is that they're not necessarily um, things that you have to do together, right? You could absolutely start with some of this uh, assisted content writing, 
even if you don't have all of your data in one place and you don't have all your data tagged and start these supervised uh, type models as well. Um, now, a lot of times we talk about uh, about Acumen and how you can do some of these things with Acumen, right? So there's some AI built in, uh, there's some natural language processing built in, but more than that, there's the ability to integrate and aggregate all of your data. And necessarily, there is a lot of, of tagging and categorization that goes along with that. So not only um, do you get the uh, integration with your source systems, but you get this kind of centralized uh, repository of all of your data um, that, that is used then for the visualizations and things that you're uh, familiar uh, to seeing, right? There's the concept of overlap, right? So we talked about uh, we talked about affinity, right? So this is uh, this is a type of analysis called association, right? Where you're looking at those who bought A also bought B, right? So in, in the association context, you might care a lot about the uh, people that went to one event and did they also go to another or did they go to an event and make a purchase or what is the overlap between different kinds of activities uh, that they can do? So this thing, these things are included, you know, out of the box and acumen. Uh, and what about uh, the idea of correlation, right? So this is not that, you know, uh, by joining the community, it caused me to renew my membership, but wouldn't you like to know that community members or volunteers or donors or whatever had a much higher retention rate, right? So wouldn't like you to be able to understand those correlations. And you can do that without using AI, you know, by using things like uh, a central uh, repository of data and uh, some strategic uh, filters, uh, predictive models. Right, so this is uh, included, as many of you know, as part of Acumen, and uh, this is where you have a, it's a supervised type of algorithm, and you have a dependent, uh, dependent variable, which is something like retention or event attendance, and you have a bunch of independent variables, which are your profile information and your behavioral data, and you can absolutely understand who is, say, you know, five or fifteen percent likely to renew versus those that are eighty-five to ninety-five. And of course, we wouldn't treat them the same, right? We think about our campaigns and, and our marketing, right? So as we go down uh, uh, different types of segments. Um, engagement is not predictive per se in the mathematical sense, but you use it for all of those things too, to identify at-risk members, prospects, pretty much every kind of individual and org uh, that we might be looking for. Preferences and interests. This is the implicit stuff, right? So this is how... Um, this is sentiment, right? We look at uh, from a natural language uh, sense. We also look at things that you search for, pages that you view, what are the topics that, that those things are tagged with and use that to inform our content. Um, yeah, um, so sentiment is, is also included. Um, anytime there's unstructured, yeah, if there's free text that you enter, uh, we're gonna be able to uh, assess uh, the sentiment of, of, uh, um, of that text, right? And then segmentation, this is another way of saying what, uh, um, you know, what uh, Mitch has already talked about, uh, we apply our data to segments, which, so it's not so homogenous group of people and content, but we start to understand, um, you know, which segments like which types of content, and then we can also serve it up to them in ways that make sense, right? So we're optimizing those calls to action uh, and that content. And we talked about, uh, about uh, website content, right? So one of the things that uh, you can get with Acumen as well is a recommendations engine. And the recommendation is based on is based on AI, right? So there's collaborative filtering where we look at um, you know two different members or two different individuals that might be the same. You know, um, you know, Bill and Mitch are the same. Um, you know, we both read articles about uh, about dogs, and then I read an article about horses, right? So maybe Mitch is interested in that same article as well. Right? That was an oversimplification, but you get the idea. Uh, there's uh, there's content based, right? So I read article A, so I might be interested. Um, and B, things that are frequently purchased together, those kinds of things. And that's the type of underlying technology based on that foundational data that allows um, the type of personalized experience that Mitch was talking about uh, on the website. So uh, this is something that uh, some of our customers are starting to uh, invest in as well. So uh, really high level stuff there um, on Acumen. This is mostly uh, in an educational session about AI. So with that, um, I want to uh, bring it back to to Mitch for some some final thoughts on the bottom line here. So yeah, I mean, first of all, again, I'm just going to reiterate that AI is a tool. Okay, 
like those things that, that Bill just showed, these are great, right? These are dashboards, but a dashboard is only something to look at in order to take action on, right? And this is not scripture. The words that are most important are likelihood and probability, right? Anyone who's been to Vegas before and plays blackjack, you're sitting with a 12. Dealer shows a six. What do you do? You do not hit. Every book, every player, every person is telling you, you do not hit. And by the way, if you do hit, the player next to you might get a little violent. Yeah. But here's the thing. <laughs> it's a probability. It is, that means at that moment, yes, you're more, it's more likely that the dealer will bust. It is not guaranteed that the dealer will bust. And there comes in instinct, intuition, experimentation. Take this stuff that, that AI can sort of spit out and have a hypothesis and try something. And if it doesn't work out, try something else. Because here's the bottom line. If it thing was so smart and everyone was so smart and this is the way, everyone would be doing it. And we wouldn't need any of it. So it is only a tool to help you make better decisions. But if you just rely on it for the decisions, you've lost the very essence of what it's trying to do for you. It is a tool like your database. So bottom line, I think set yourself up for success. Don't go hire a bunch of data you know, scientists and start embarking on these projects. My own opinion is again, use the, the, the built-in AI tools and discovery tools that are already in your existing platforms to start understanding what it can do. Start small, start something you can measure, experiment with it. And by the way, if it doesn't work, try something else. I hey, Mitch, personally, believe, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's a question. Uh, Nancy asked a question in, in the Q&A when and it was a good segue with what you were talking about. Um, she asked how much of these, how much do these platforms cost? And um, would you please reiterate the names of some of the platforms? So um, I don't know, we didn't yeah. talk about it. Go ahead. So, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do. Some of the more AI assisted writing ones are pretty low cost to get into. You know, I'll do a sort of shameless plug for Contentware. It's a fairly low cost platform to get involved with, not just for AI assisted writing, but more for those high level campaign generation. But these are much more affordable. They can get you real results right away. And again, there, there are scores and scores of these out there. Like I mentioned, you can Google AI assisted writing. I know there's one called Copy AI and Jarvis and a couple of these other ones that you can do and it's super low cost. Now, the more that you try and get into some of the higher value data-driven ones, those can become more expensive, right? But again, if you're using a CRM or an AMS, like if you think of just like, like Salesforce or HubSpot or, or all these other AMSs, they already have AI driven discovery tools in them that you can start to do. And that's literally, I, I think that's, that's one of the best ways to start is using those internal discovery tools. Again, I do think depending on your role within the organization, if you are in sort of the marketing and communication side, you need to look at it sort of in two ways, right? What is the underlying data models that are going to help me segment people into these different buckets that I can then um, deliver content to? But you are also tasked with generating that content. And I just think from all the experience that I have seen people trying these projects, when you start with some of the stuff like content generation, AI-assisted writing, automated campaign generation, you can see the results almost instantaneously. And you can start saying, mm, wow, I might be able to scale my operations pretty quickly this way. So I think that that, in my view, is one of the best places to start with the natural language processing and use the tools that are already um, um, built in. But again, I wanna leave you with the, with the same um, thought that I started with. This is coming and it's not something that we can stop. And I don't wanna be all Terminator 2 on this, right? But, but, but it, it's like, each day, this is growing exponentially in terms of how people or how it's, it's permeating into every single decision we make. And we need to understand it more and more and ask difficult questions and figure out how we can harness this power for the benefit of our internal organizations. All right, awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Mitch. And thank you for, those, uh, for your participation uh, in today's uh, webinar. Uh, we've got a few things uh, uh, coming up. 
Uh, on the 4th of October, we're going to be talking with our friends at PropFuel about how to capture uh, fresh member profile data. Um, got another partner webinar coming up at the end of October on the 20th. Um, that's going to be about um, using data to produce content, right? So a lot of uh, uh, some similar things that, that that Mitch was talking about today, and that's going to be with, uh, with Blue Sky uh, eLearn. Um, we, do, we do have another how-to webinar coming up, and that's going to be about building the business case for analytics. Um, that would include uh, things like AI, and that's going to talk about how to identify some of those ROI areas that you can take to make the case with senior leadership uh, and with uh, your board. So again, I want to thank Mitch uh, for joining us today. It was really informative. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. And uh, please join us for uh, some uh, upcoming uh, webinars uh, in the future. Thanks a lot. Have a great day, everyone.